nursing students? Time to talk. Welcome to the Real Talk School of Nursing Podcast, Season 4, Episode 12. I am your good and faithful host, Michael Smith. And I'm your new co-host, Casey Jones. You can support the show directly on our Patreon account at www.patreon.com slash realtalknursing and gain patron benefits such as early content, shoutouts, and special swag. Write into the show at realtalknursing at gmail.com or use Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at realtalknursing or at refreshments and narcotics RN. Thank you for supporting our friends, affiliates, and sponsors. Thank you to everyone who started following us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. More listeners means more and better shows. Make sure to share the episode with classmates and help give a hand up to those who are coming behind us. Welcome to our nursing community. Don't forget to reach out and tell us if you have any announcements or special shout outs to other friends and colleagues. If you like the show, the Real Talk School of Nursing podcast is available almost everywhere. So go to wherever you download podcasts, subscribe, rate us, review us, and write into the show and smash that subscribe button. Remember to leave only five-star reviews because that's the only ratings that count to get us noticed by more nursing students. We want you to be part of this crazy nursing school journey. So welcome, Jason. Um, thank you for coming on to the podcast. So why don't you tell me to the audience, if if the audience never heard from you before, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself and what your page is and, and kind of what you're doing? Absolutely. Thank you for having me, man. I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Jason. I, uh, I'm the... Uh the host and the star of fire department chronicles make funny videos for firefighters medical professionals uh police officers pretty much all across the gamut of first responders and uh medical professionals and uh, i'm also the vice president of fire department coffee and a spokesman for banyan treatment centers for mental health for first responders oh really cool so you yeah. so you have like a bunch of these are just like side projects that you just kind of got into yeah, you know, uh, the, the coffee I got involved with uh, about about three and a half years ago, uh, just love coffee. It's kind of a staple of being a first responder in general. Yep. Yep. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, or a nurse or, you know, pretty much it's just like, it, and anything that if you have children, you also need it as well. Uh, so, <laughs> pretty much humanity. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, you got involved because I loved it and, and found a really good way to provide good, high quality coffee to people who need it and then um, give back to uh, injured and ill first responders as well and you know with the mental health that that kind of that comes with anything in humanity but especially with uh, medical professionals or first responders mental health is such an important thing to kind of focus in on and bring some light to so found a, a really really good uh, group of treatment centers that uh, have great ideas and they've you know their heart in the right place so jumped on board with them to help out as much as possible it's really cool thanks man so um, there's a couple reasons that I wanted you to come on. And, and first, because uh, I, I'd, I'd watched several of your videos over the last year, and um, I think you have a really great sense of humor. And I, and I, I, I think very sorely right now in the middle of all, all, all the crap that's going on, we, we need to laugh. And, yeah. and you, and I talked, you and I talked offline a little bit about, about – um, you know, all these people have all this time on their hands now and they're they're by themselves, maybe in an echo chamber. And, you know, the lack of stimulus drives them towards <laughs> towards things. And it's and it's and and you wouldn't think that that some of your videos just watching just watching the whole gamut of them, that that somebody could be offended by offended by some of it. But. I think because of some of the universality of some of your videos, there's a wider audience and, and I think there's a lower threshold for people to feel offended. Yeah. Um, and maybe now more than ever. And I think people are just kind of feeling that emotional detachment with where things are right now. And so they're just trying to feel something and it's, and it's easier to feel offended than it is to find something that makes you feel happy. And, well, I mean, and so I think yeah, we all I mean, need laughs. 
yeah, hundred percent. You gotta the, laughing is a, a universal part of the world, right? I mean, we obviously you and I, you know, from a physiological aspect, what laughing and, and uh, joy does for you, um, you know, with neurotransmitters and stuff like that. But you know, I think in general, what happens is when, and I know this, um, I was I had to stay home for uh, seven days uh, or ten days actually is what it was, um, just because of you know precautionary stuff and. Being in my house, it was, and I love my girlfriend. We, we actually get along great, but uh, I have a decent sized home, and I was losing my mind. Like, <laughs> yeah, like yeah, you can only sit in the house so long before you're like, "Holy crap, man!" And I'm lucky because I have someone to talk to. I can't imagine people that are by themselves in their house, and the only connection they have to the world is through Zoom. You know, what I mean, <laughs> like, holy crap, man, like, that's not okay. So laughing is a good thing. It is very easy to find negativity in the world. That is simple you know it, but trying to look at things in a mildly positive light um is it, it's a little more difficult but it's so necessary you know it's something that i think everyone should try to practice at some point in time try to find that the happiness in something even though it, it seems negative this this entire thing going on right now is, is extremely depressing you know social media is very depressing the news is outrageously depressing so uh even though it may go against the grain i think trying to create some kind of humor uh, will will really really help humanity stay on a mildly straight path right now. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so this so the second reason I kind of wanted to bring you on uh, is because since my military days, I have always found value in learning about things that are going on upstream and downstream of me. So there's always processes. There's always things that are going, you know, that are happening prior to me entering a situation and then I'm eventually going to hand it off to somebody else and learning those things upstream and downstream is extremely valuable to me so as a as an ER nurse we see medics you know you guys come in and it can be really difficult to imagine what you see before you come into the ER and and you know we often talk I mean because it's a nursing podcast we talk about new grads we talk about uh, nursing in general, and and we talk often about the med surge perspective, and yes. and that's where you know, and that's where because that's where most nurses start, and that's the majority of nurses in the nursing career work their entire career in different specialties within med surge, but we don't often talk about the pre hospital care and pre hospital experiences. So I was I was kind of hoping that you might be able to to tell me in your in your in your expert way in in your own way tell me about the kinds of things that you see in the field and how that and and, and you know everything up to the point where you where you drive into an ER and drop somebody off or you know those kinds of situations what are the kinds of things that you're seeing in the field absolutely um you know first off I want to my, so my ex-wife is is a nurse and she works on bed search and I for the the multiple times that I went and saw her Med surge is, in my opinion, probably the worst floor on the face of the butt that you can possibly go on because it just seems like it is a, a constant demand of somebody asking you to do something, you know, whatever it is the entire time. And I think their patient to uh, nurse ratio is also higher than the average. So, um, I, I but, but that is a floor I would never want to work on. Um, and a lot of respect to nurses in general. We we always joke in the, in, in my section of the field you know with emergency response uh we always joke about nurses because it's just what we do but man i gotta say i can never be a nurse i worked in a hospital for <laughs> six months and i wanted to shoot myself because it was like you, you with us the one good thing that we have is most of the time there are you know long transports and stuff but most of the time 30 minutes is the most you're dealing with the patient mm -hmm. you guys are dealing with them for hours like i'm good i appreciate it uh but um no the um with, with emergency response in general with with what we're seeing in the field i think the number one thing you know we always joke uh bsi scene safety that's the you know first thing you learn yeah in school. Um, <laughs> you i know, remember that because i was a, i was an emt before i was a nurse so it was <laughs> like it just it, it it does it becomes a nerve psi scene safe you know <laughs> uh, 100%, yeah. I don't know if you saw the video that I put out. It's like what EMTs say, and at least three times in that video I mentioned BSIC safety because that is like the only damn thing you learn when you're in school is BSIC safety. You know, um, but like that's the number one thing that's happening right now is that you know 
and, and, and a lot of people are, you know, there's a whole hazard paint thing that I'm not sure if we even get into, but, um, you know, people are saying like, we're showing up on scenes and we don't know what's going on. That's, that's the number one issue with first, re- or first responders is like, when you show up, you think you're going walking into one thing, but it turns out to be completely different than what we thought it was going to be. And that can probably go across all medical, uh, fields in general. But, um, that's the biggest thing that we're seeing is that we don't know. So we're walking into a house and somebody saying that they're, that they're having ankle pain, but we find out they've had a um a fever for the last four days and their ankles their ankle is swollen because they're having you know massive uh, possible uh, uh cardio uh, uh cardiogenic issues so on and so forth so right. um that, that's that's probably the number one thing you know and, and um <laughs> they're having massive chf backup yeah. and and you know it's been going on for six months and the, you know they it looks, <laughs> you're you're looking a little poofy, ma'am. <laughs> yeah, dude. I, I I gotta tell you one of my one of one of the biggest calls that I've ever like referenced when it came to like you have no clue what you're walking into. No, you don't. Is, the, the the level of ambiguity that you guys deal with is just amazing, and that's one. I mean, and that's really one of the 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 principal motivations for me to have you know, pre-hospital care type of person like you on is because, you know, we, we think we, you know, in the ER, we think we deal with ambiguity and we really don't know what we're dealing with. And sometimes we don't, but I think that, I mean, but you're going into people's houses and you have really no idea what you're walking into. It, and, I mean, from multiple angles, absolutely. You know, I've had calls <laughs> where, you know, like, where I thought scenes were safe and they were not safe at all. Like, guns <laughs> falling out of people's pockets. Like, oh, my God, that's not okay. You know, and then uh, I get a call where we show up. The guy's like, the guy's like, I, dude, I don't want to go to the hospital. I'm fine. My wife called. And, and the wife is like, he needs to go to the hospital. I'm, and, and he's looking at me, right? I'm actually, I can see his back is what it is. And, and, and I'm looking at him from the side. Side and I'm like, dude, why? Like, why is your wife seeing you go? He's like, I don't know, man. She's insane. And I'm like, okay. He's like, she's like, she's like, his foot. His foot is bad. So I look at his foot and I'm looking at it from the top and I'm like, there's nothing wrong with his foot. And the way the guy's talking to me, he's like, I'm fine. His left foot is bandaged. His right foot is what she's complaining about. So at the end of this call, I'm like, well, what are you talking? Like, describe to me exactly what you're talking about. And she's like, she's like, look at the bottom of his foot. And I go look at the bottom of his foot. He has a like a cyst on his foot, and uh, like a what do you call it a, a, a cubital uh, a cubital cyst? I can't think of the name yeah, of it right now, but uh, um, an ulcer. It's yeah, an ulcer. Yeah, it has gone through. I can see his heel bone. <laughs> like the entire bottom of his foot is gone, or at least on his heel. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, dude, you need to go to the hospital, man. Like, but this guy is just like, I'm fine, man. There's nothing wrong with me. And and the why, like, I just absolutely unbelievable, right? So, like, thank God that we actually did an assessment on this guy and, like, checked him out. But that's, like, you have no clue. We, we walked in there thinking it was an unknown medical is what it was. Um, but, I mean, I think in general <laughs> that the number one thing that we don't have in the field that a lot of nurses and doctors and stuff they have is that, you know, when we, when we walk into something, most of the time we're trying to diagnose something. I've always talked about differential diagnosis with my with people that I precept. Um, but I say, you know, don't ever find out what's wrong, find out what's not wrong. And then we can really, you know, narrow this yeah. down. Yeah. If you're looking for what's wrong, there's a lot of things that share signs and symptoms, but let's just find out what's really, really not wrong. And then we can maybe, you know, focus in on this. So, um, you know, but yeah, it's we don't have tests. We don't know. I mean, what what do they say with uh, heart attacks? Uh, you know, uh, with, for twelve leads, you catch like 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 five to ten percent of actual MIs on a twelve lead through uh, through elevation. Uh, you know, it's troponin levels that you have to check, and we don't even have. They're trying to introduce stuff like that. They're finger prick uh, finger prick troponins, and uh, they <laughs> started to give it to us, and they're like, oh yeah, this can also go high for sepsis. I'm like, okay, well that's <laughs> well, they're still gonna come in anyway, so I guess yeah, exactly. You know. <laughs> Exactly. So, um, but yeah, I think in general, the, the number one thing that separates us from most medical professionals is that we just, there's, there's a huge unknown that is always associated with what we're doing because we just don't have the tests, at least the definitive tests to be able to tell whether what we're looking at is, is, is an issue or not, or, or what type of issue it is kind of thing. So how have things changed for you over the last few weeks? Cause for example, for for us in 
a level one trauma center where where things are are I don't I I will never say the keyword, but mm-hmm. our <laughs> census is down. Yeah, you know, and so I mean, our census is down overall. We are certainly getting an influx of you know, what we call PUIs or, you know, people under, you know, patients under investigation, people who are suspective yeah. of having COVID type symptoms. But, you know, I mean, that that seems to have such a wide array of things for people anyway. This is, you know, I had a, I had a patient who came in, for example, for back pain and we did a, we did a, um, a CT on him and the CT guy's like, well, you know, he's got like glass lights, like, you know, um, pneumonia uh, you know, or whatever. So it's like, so suddenly this patient that I had been going in and out of the room the whole time, you know, with no precautions on is suddenly a, a, a potential COVID ro- rule out. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, well, freaking great. You know, but how are, so how are things changing for you? Cause, cause we're, we don't, we don't see, I mean, it was for, for like a week or two, maybe, you know, well, probably 10 days. I mean, we were dead quiet. It was so eerie. It was so yeah. weird. We were not getting ambulances. We weren't getting, I mean, w- 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 you know, we would get, we get, we, we got traumas all the time. I mean, obviously. And then we would get things like cardiac arrest coming in and we get these, these horribly septic patients that are coming in from everywhere. And for 10 days, nothing. I mean, yeah. absolutely nothing. And now we're creeping back up and we're getting, you know, other stuff going on, but, I think but, 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 but how does, story. how has it changed for you guys pre in pre hospital? I think from talking to a few of my friends, that's, that's really, well, I mean, there's so many factors involved now, right? Right. So, right. Uh, especially for first responders, a, no one's allowed to leave their freaking house. So like any place that's situated in areas that are like nightclubs and stuff like that, or, or restaurants or anything, there's not going to be anyone there because, right. We can't like no one's allowed to go out of the house. Um, B, I think a lot of people are now because m- with most people they're saying that 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 their call volumes are dropping, but um, it's because no one wants to go to the damn hospital, and and that's totally understandable. At least I don't. I'm positive where you're at. Um, you know, people go to the hospital for reasons that are not emergencies. Like it happens all the time. I've yeah. been called for toe pain and ankle pain. And yep. I had a lady call me and she's like, I just want a sandwich. Bring me to the hospital. You know, <laughs> and you're not allowed to punch people in the face for some reason. I don't know. But, um, you know, <laughs> so, um, but, uh, you know, like I think now people are genuinely so scared that they don't want to go because they don't want to be exposed to other people. So um, we're seeing a drop off as well. But with regards to, response to calls this is different this is it's totally different i i'm wearing an n95 mask or some something very similar to it on every single call that i go to Mm -hmm. um the n95 masks are recycled and people are upset about that but i would rather have a a, a recycled n95 mask on my face than nothing at all yeah Um, we're, we're going like a week or something like that you know as long basically as long as you can stand it to just yes. to, just to make sure that we're extending our our resources as as best we can. Yeah, absolutely. And um, we are minimizing the amount of people that are going to calls. So right. uh, you know, standard response. If it's unneeded, then we don't use our engine crew. We have an engine and an ambulance that respond together. We call them rescues, but um, but uh, so only a certain uh, you know only the rescue will grow in if necessary. Everyone wears a mask the second we touch somebody. Um, we put a surgical mask on them, right. you know, cause the, the whole thing is that, you know, uh, if we get a mask on them, then that reduces the chances of them, you know, of us contracting anything. Right. Um, and then, and then if there's anything suspected of COVID, we have a, a specific, uh, COVID unit that responds. They screen them. If they do think that they are, they call a med, med alert. We show up fully, you know, dressed out. Uh, otherwise, you know, they don't call the med alert and we just show up with our N95 masks. Hmm. Um, so, I mean, you know, a lot of this, this is the two big things that I've learned from this. Um, I've learned a few things, but the big thing that I'm learning from this um, is I don't know how bad this is, but I, I wouldn't consider this an actual like a, tons of people are dying pandemic yet. Um mm-hmm. But I can't imagine what what it would look like if we ran into something that was killing 40% of the people it was touching. Like that would be absolute pandemonium, and I don't know what it would even look like because this is insanity as it is. Yeah. Um, 
But the other thing that I looked at was that, you know, a lot of people want to point fingers about N95 masks and being protected, so on and so forth. The one thing that I really looked at was I've been a paramedic for 14 years. I've maybe worn an N95 mask five times in my career leading up to this point. Mm -hmm. So for a lot of people, they're like, why don't we have N95 masks? We never had a a need for them before. Right. No, (laughs) I totally agree. (laughs) You know, so, I mean, we do need to be protected in what we just need to adapt and overcome. That's that's the number one thing we need to remember, that we got into this field with the understanding that adapting and overcoming is the only, is, is the, it's probably the, the number one motto of uh, medicine. Yeah. We're practicing at all times and we really don't know what we're doing. Uh, and then also the motto of like, hey, we got to adapt in some way, shape or form, you know. So let's let's take a quick break and then we'll come back and. uh uh, we'll kind of continue the conversation. Let's take a quick commercial break, and then we'll come right back. Sounds good. And, of course, we have to pay those bills. So to help us with our sponsorship for this segment is none other than Andrew Heaton of the Political Orphanage and of Alienating the Audience. Our sponsor for today is... Snuffies off Route 44. <laughs> Snuffy's is a truly outstanding American diner with a wide range of well-priced food for the whole family, made all the more enjoyable by the fact that every waiter and waitress takes your order and delivers it to you on horseback. Yes, imagine the delight your family will experience as they ask for scrambled eggs and freshly squeezed Florida orange juice from a man wearing an apron seated on top of a horse. If you've ever been to Sonic and you've seen one of those high school cheerleaders delivering malts and roller sk- uh, on roller skates and you thought, wow, that's impressive, well, you will be filled with rage at what a gullible yokel you were for having been impressed by such a paltry feat of locution when compared to the grandeur and the majesty of a waiter or waitress riding through a diner on a horse. Plus, if you go to Snuffy's on Tuesday nights, tell them that you listen to this podcast. They'll give you 30% off the meatloaf special. That's a humdinger of a deal right there. That's money you can put into a 529 college savings plan, or if you don't have children like me, into a 401k. Snuffy's off Route 44, because everything tastes better from a horse. (laughs) To hear more from Andrew Heaton, you can search him out on basically every platform there is out there by searching for at... Mighty Heaton. That's H E A T O N. Mighty Heaton. Let's jump back into it. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. So, um, as we were kind of talking about before, um, by the time a patient comes to the floor in a med surge unit, you know, there's some kind of medical history. There's, you know, the, the doc has done, you know, some detective work. We've done, you know, several assessments, you know, over a period of whatever amount of time. You know, medications have been started, uh, treatment plan. There's some medical history. You know, uh, um, there there's a there's a treatment plan set out by the, like the hospitalist, and we've started a bunch of stuff. Yep. But how do you guys deal with that massive amount of ambiguity when you go like when you go in and meet a, pe- a patient in the field? Like, how do you deal with just because you're walking in and you've got 360 degrees of stuff and you need to, you know, you need to bumper bowl your way to some kind of thing. So you can say, okay, well we're bringing in this patient for this reason. Like, how do you, how do you deal with that much ambiguity? I I mean, for me, it's never, for me, like from day one, it's always been the same thing. This virus hasn't changed anything for me. The only thing it's changed is that um your chance of contracting something is higher but the you know bsi scene safety is nothing has truly changed i mean it's always been the same you always universal precautions you know everyone has a disease you know that kind of thing um (laughs) i joke when i i joke when i teach classes i'm like universal precautions everyone has a disease look at the person next to you they have herpes Uh, you know and everyone laughs laughs they always look at like one person and i'm like what do you do on the weekends bro um so like uh (laughs) or like one of your videos one of your videos i was like jokes on you you can't you can't contract something you already have (laughs) yeah Yeah, exactly (gasps) sorry (laughs) Yeah, Um, yeah. I think in in general, the ambiguity is, you know, you just approach things like everybody has it, you know, so you just when when there's something like this running around, you just take the extra precaution of protecting whatever 
path that disease tends to take. So for this one happens to be, you know, a respiratory based droplet thing. So yep. we got to make sure that we're putting uh, masks on ourselves or masks on the person. And then, and then you just treat them like a normal patient. Yep. It's like when HIV was, you know, blew up and everybody was freaking out and it was like, bro, if you don't touch their blood, then you're good. Right. Like you have to like, I mean, your chance of contracting HIV outside of the body is ridiculously low. Um, and it's like, Hey man, if you just wear your gloves and, and you, and you make sure that you're not like spraying blood all over your face and your eyes or your orifices and stuff like that, then you should be good. <laughs> just, just maybe take a little bit more precautions than the average, but even if they don't have HIV, you know, you're not, you're not doing weird stuff with them. So, um, it, it, it's, it's, you just, <laughs> just, sorry, man, I got a weird sense of humor. So. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, it, it just that is not part of pre-hospital procedure, young man. I know, I know. <laughs> um, so I think, I think in general, you know, you just treat this person. Here's here is the one thing that everyone is failing to recognize: BSI scene safety. Uh, you know, precautionary stuff has always been around, yep. but everyone chose to ignore it. And now, when there's a massive disease running around, now everyone wants to point out the lack of of PPE. Yeah, like true. Last time. Last time I checked, when you were start, starting IVs, you were supposed to wear eye protection, you know, and if they have, you know, you even think that they have a respiratory anything going on, you're supposed to put an N95 mask on. Mm -hmm. Like, but, you know, you never did that. But now is the time to point it out like that. That's where the issues start to come in. You know, mm -hmm. that's actually that's a that's a really great point. So so where does where does the. So where does the where does the sense of humor come from? Like why like how is it that you've that you've kind of developed this you know, I don't know, sardonic look at 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 how at 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 your profession at how the world is working right now. Like where does this come from? Massive mental health issues. Uh, <laughs> no, <kidding>. uh, <laughs> Amen. Um, <laughs> I, I think I think I've always found a way to kind of look at the humorous side of things because I think it's just who I've been growing up. Um, but we all know that if there is any type of humor that is rampant in our field, it's dark humor. Like that's just that's just the way it is, you know. And, no. Um, no, I know. So what? <laughs> um, you know, I think um, I just always looked at stuff like, hey, man, you know, it's situational. I'm going to do a video on dark humor and how like explaining to like rookies what dark humor is in case they don't know about it yet. Um, you know how like it is funny, but just not outside of the station. Like, don't be stupid and tell your, your dark humor joke, you know, at your Christmas party. Like, no one's going to find that joke funny. In fact, you're probably going to get fired. Uh, so, um, but um, I think humor is so necessary. It, it, it is so necessary on a physiological uh, field or plane. It's so necessary on just a social plane. Like you have to step back from the serious and you have to find some light, you know, the silver lining in the clouds. Like you have to do it to keep your sanity. Um, you know, it, it, the whole like uh, my uh, my grandma always had a saying and it had to do with like uh, getting with the wrong crowds. But, you know, if you, if you hang out at a barbershop long enough, you're eventually going to get a haircut. You know, if you subscribe, <laughs> it's the truth, man. It's, I, not, I mean, a, it's not a problem for either of us as beautiful yeah, bald men. Yeah, neither of us will have that problem. But, um, but uh, <laughs> like if, if, if you constantly subscribe to negativity if you surround yourself with negative people all the time you are eventually physiologically going to become a negative depressed person and that is just a fact yeah. um but if you can find some humor in in what's happening around us it'll at least let you um reset and maybe even save your life man just reset and kind of look at this perspective a little bit differently and then move forward with with what's going on around you depression and, and crappy stuff will always be around that's guaranteed yep. um but if you can if you can somewhat laugh somewhat have a good or somewhat find some humor in the things that are happening around you even if it has nothing to do with this it's laughing about a dog bone or whatever you want to laugh about then you should be able to somewhat find some happiness right now so i i i'm a very 
I don't think I'm a very funny person, which is, which is unfortunate because I'd like to be. But but I do find humor in a lot of things. Like I, I have a very ironic sense of humor. And so I see the first thing I see is irony in a lot of situations. I'm like, well, that is weird because like a week ago you said, you know, or, you know, things, things like yeah. that. But but I think what what what's really useful about like what you're doing is that there's there's I think there's a universe at universality to it. Anyone in the medical field can understand the situation you're in, even if they've never dealt with, you know, pre-hospital stuff. Or like uh, several months ago, it was it was you did a you did a video on like um, oh, what was it? It was like uh, um, oh, it was it, it was like a dart or something like that that you would yeah, throw yeah, at the patients. Elbow blow dart. Yes, 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 yeah. that one. You know. And, you know, we all joke about, like, the, you know, like, we should have, like, a Valium, uh, you know, salt lick in the, in, the, in the waiting room. Like, that kind of stuff. Like, there's just, like, everybody just needs to settle down a little bit, you know. But there's, anybody in the medical field can understand, understand that. And, and I think you bring a lot of great levity to it. But I imagine that much of it is based in reality. Yeah. It's a hundred percent. And all, all of my humor, all of those videos come from something that I've either experienced or seen in, in you know in the fourteen years that I've been in the medical field. But the best part is is like that when I'm making fun of different firefighters and EMTs and paramedics, ninety percent of those characters are me. Like, I'm those <laughs> that people. is the best part. That is the best part. <laughs> like like I, the the best part, the funniest stuff is like when I'm just like, wow. I can't believe I just did that. <laughs> yeah. We all, we all do. You know, and the Haldol blow darts, the, the Haldol blow dart, anyone who had a problem with that, the, the funniest part is is that we all know Haldol takes forever to kick in, so it yeah. wouldn't even work. But it was just like, you know, I had a patient, that video came because I had a patient uh, during the whole Flaca, uh, Flaca thing. I tackle or we, we we get this guy and he's, he's, he's twice, <laughs> and if you, twice my size okay <laughs> let me let me let me take a pause so yeah. what is this channel that we keep talking about oh fire department chronicles fire uh, department chronicles and it can be found where facebook instagram tiktok youtube we're, we're on everything uh snapchat every once in a while that kind of thing but uh yeah mainly facebook and instagram are, are the two big ones and then tiktok i'll throw up some videos that i don't throw on any other channels just because uh it's a little bit of a different viewership sure so yeah. so what's uh, man i've already forgotten what it's called what's it called again fire department chronicles and what was the coffee what was the coffee that you're a vice president of so uh, vice president of uh fire department coffee fire uh, department coffee yeah, the or owned and operated by firefighters and veterans, um, and uh, we ten uh, percent of all of our net proceeds go back to supporting sick and injured first responders. Awesome. So okay, so sorry to interrupt, but continue, no. continue. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> you know, it, it's this. It's all. So I get this guy. He's he's on Flaca. You know, we we have to like he's twice <laughs> my size. We got to hold this dude down. We get, you know we give him. We give him um, his, uh, you know, we give him some Haldol. I give him Haldol, a, a cocktail of Haldol and uh, and Brissette. And I, I give it to him, and, man, he is, like, comes out of this, and he is like, what in the crap is going on right now? Like, you know, and, of course, like, in that moment, we bond, and it's like, dude, you, you know, you, you had a bad thing. You know, I, I laugh and I joke because – we in the medical field tend to uh, judge people very heavily, and we forget that sometimes, sometimes we've made the same decisions, we just didn't have the same outcome. <laughs> um, um, you know, like a lot of us have smoked weed. Sorry if you don't, you know, if you haven't, great, whatever. At some point in time in our childhood, we've smoked pot. You know, this guy smoked pot, and the guy laced it with flaca, Oof. and it was a bad day for him, you know? So it's like, you know, it is what it is, man, but like all I could think about because this guy was so big at one point in time he's running from us and he's 300 pounds if this guy turns around and starts beating the crowd but he's nothing I can do so in that moment I was like man if I just had a blow dart of how about and said you make my life so much easier just run and then he's out and I'm like all right buddy <laughs> welcome back <laughs> so. oh god dang. so talk, talk to me 
Here, let's let's take a quick break. I think that's a good that's a uh, that's a good breaking point, and then we'll switch gears, and then uh, and then let's come back. So let's hear from let's uh, go to break to a commercial, and then when we come back, let's talk about paramedic school, nursing school, that kind of stuff. Sounds great. All right. Nick's Horseless Diner. Nick's Horseless Diner has one single promise it makes to you and to every patron who enters that great big green awning. Delicious food at a reasonable price in a fun atmosphere with absolutely no horses whatsoever. Horses are not only allowed in, not allowed in the diner, they are certainly not used by the kitchen or waitstaff. No donkeys, no mules, and certainly, without question, no horses. The management of Nick's Horseless Diner is so opposed to the concept of horses crossing the threshold of eateries that it refused service to jockeys until 2014 when required to by federal court order. Yes, sir, come to Nick's Horseless Diner for good food, good times, and a palpable dearth of ponies. Nick's Horseless Diner, no horses ever. Uh, okay. Um, if you're new to the program, that was probably a slightly confusing advertisement for Nick's Horseless Diner. To, sh- to put that in context for you, uh, last week, our sponsor was Snuffy's, which is a, a diner off Route 44, where the wait staff rides horses. That's their thing. The, all the waiters and waitresses are on horses when they take your order or when they deliver it to you. So it would appear, and, and this, is, this is sheer speculation on my part, but it would appear that Nix is mounting some kind of very aggressive ad campaign aimed at the selling point that they don't have horses, which is odd in that I just sort of assume that you don't have horses to begin. You don't need to tell me your diner doesn't have horses. I would, I would never think that your restaurant had horses involved in food preparation. I mean, like I've never driven up to an Arby's before and gone, uh, Hey, I'm thinking about going in with my folks, but I wanted to confirm there are no horses inside beforehand. No one does that. So that's kind of strange. The thing that now that I'm thinking about it, the thing that's even weirder about that is the name of the business is Nick's Horseless Diner. So it's not just a transient marketing campaign. They're actually, they appear to have started a business model based on not having horses, which I I don't even know what that's about. Uh, I should point out that... um, We still maintain a good relationship with Snuffies. In fact, you can now buy Snuffies t-shirts. We do have some Snuffies merchandise. Uh, I've not been to Nick's yet, but I'm planning to go later tonight uh, to enjoy their fine atmosphere with its lack of horses and good food. Uh, So more on that later. Nick's, Nick's Horseless Diner. No horses ever. To hear more from Andrew Heaton, you can search him out on basically every platform there is out there by searching for at Mighty Heaton. That's H-E-A-T-O-N, Mighty Heaton. Let's get back to the show. You're listening to the Real Talk School of Nursing podcast with Michael Smith. So welcome back. Um, I think much of paramedic school and nursing school is really similar. Uh, Obviously, there's a different terminal focus. Uh, but you know we're learning the same AMP. You're learning the same drugs. Uh, yeah. There's there's a lot of similarities between the two. Can you tell me about a school experience uh, when like what school was what what's paramedic school like for you and and kind of tell me about it a little bit. Uh, you know I, the the biggest thing I remember about paramedic school was my first day. Um, <laughs> I finished EMT school on Friday, started medic school on Monday. Oh jeez. Yeah, it was insane, um, but I wanted to get it done fast, that kind of thing. So um, I remember sitting in my um, – sitting in the class, and they walked up, and they handed us our stack of books. It was like ACLS, PHDLS, all the stuff, uh, and they they told us our schedule, and then um, – and then they went over all the different ride times and clinicals that we were going to have to do. And I remember sitting there and having a full on panic attack and being like, there's no way, there's no way I'm going to be able to do this. Like it was insane because I was also working a full-time job as a mechanic at the time. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, (laughs) so it was absolutely insane to me. Um, but you know, 
Medic school was overwhelming just in a sense of like you're learning a whole new language. At least EMT school, I had to learn a whole new language. And then through medic school, you had to be able to apply those things. And now we're getting more in depth with pharmacology and AMP and all that stuff. Um, but overall, I think uh, medic school for me, the hardest part of it was just buckling down and understanding that my life as I knew, as I know it, is over for the period of time that I'm in school, right? Is, like, I mean, no, that's totally that. That is a that is an absolute parallel. Like, and yeah. and there's so many people who don't understand that about they 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 go into nursing school and they don't they don't understand like look like you're gonna have to put your the rest of your life on hold f- to to successfully make it through this because they are gonna require a massive amount of dedication for yeah. this. It's so dense. It is. It's dense. It's new. That's the thing is people don't get it. Like you're not, you're not learning. You're not going to English class, right? Which English class is hard, but this is something that has been applied throughout your life. You're just becoming an expert at it, right? For most people, this is your first experience with medical anything so mm-hmm. now you need to know what the sodium potassium pump is and how magnesium slows down but you know and it's like what what the hell is magnesium i thought that makes you poop like like those like <laughs> these are the things I mean, it does but you know um you know it, but like <laughs> these are things that that people forget like you were you are now stepping into a completely different realm of life and you need to stop whatever whatever you're doing um you know because you want to be good at it right and then right. you know th- and it's just I, there is a symptom of the world right now and it's not everybody but it's you know it's a large portion of it and it is a very double-edged sword we want instantaneous knowledge but we don't want to have to work for it and people want to graduate uh with uh, an associate's degree in something and make three hundred thousand dollars a year when like Listen, when you graduate from medic school, you are useless. You, you, oh, congratulations. You know a bunch of knowledge, but you do not know how to apply any oh, of that. In for all sure. Those, you know, in all the scenarios oh. that you learned, yeah, none of them are going to present that way. No, I've had one person where I've walked in and they are, you know, uh, your, your patient's tripoding and they look at you and they're sweating and diaphoretic and they say, uh, I'm going to die. I had one of those. The rest of them present... The, the, I had an SVT guy saying my back hurts. I'm like, okay. Your patient like, is now dead. They have a katana yeah. sword in their back. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is my favorite video of all time. Like, you know, because like, it's the truth, man. I had a guy. He's like, he's gardening outside. Uh, he's gardening outside, and the left side of his face uh, is not working properly. I'm like, okay. And so what, we go through the what whole, do you do? The whole thing. He's an organophosphate poisoning. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> he keeps vomiting. Like, oh my god, man. So. Uh, <laughs> I, I there was a that. second ninja who was hiding in the background in the bushes because you're now dead because you have a katana sword and you're back now. Yeah, dude, I'm telling you, that's, all those go like that. Which man. orange is the most orange? Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, but, you know, I think they just some people graduate medic school and they are ready to go. Like they understand the stuff. They can apply all the knowledge that they have learned to the patients that they're taking care of. But most people just don't do that. And that is normal. Like don't put a ton of pressure on yourself. Your only job right now is to take the billion pieces of knowledge, jam it in your little like brain, and then hope to God you don't forget it when you're crapping later. Like that, those are the, that's the old, your only goal in life right now. Now, once we get out of school and you actually get hired, then you'll find out the stuff that you really need to know, yeah. you know, right. um, and then just become an expert at that, that 10% or 20% of the knowledge that you've learned. So can you, can you tell me about a time that you really struggled in school? I, um, at one point in time, stopped being a mechanic and started working at AMR 
um, and which I, I, a lot of people crap on private ambulance companies, but I say work for them because it gives you the ability to talk to patients. Mm -hmm. Uh, there, there is a huge art lost in the ability to talk to a person and read what they're doing and comfort them through words. Uh, you, you know, yes, you want to punch people in the face on a daily basis, but you know, sometimes you want to be nice to them. Um, but, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I went, uh, so I was, I had to work. The only way I could get through medic school was to work. Uh, I had to work 6 PM to 6 AM and then drive about an hour South of me and sleep in my car for three hours and then, um, go to school. So there was a period of time where I struggled pretty hard through, through school during that. Um, and then, you know, some of the stuff that I wasn't too like, like PHTLS and stuff like that, or learning about, you know, the way cells work, I, that, that was hard for me because I don't really care what the powerhouse of the cell is. Um, but you know, it was something I had to learn. So that was, that was hard for me, but the lack of sleep was, was definitely a very difficult period for me. Um, what's, what's like the, the craziest school related thing that you can remember, you know, where if, where if someone says something about it, you, you know, you get the thousand yard stare, you know, your heart starts beating hard. Like, do you, do you remember something like that? Man, it's so, it's, it's been, it's been 13 years since I've been in school for, uh, for medics. So, um, not really. I mean, you or, know, or in your career or in your career, like, like, yeah. is there, is there still something that sticks out to you as one of those things where it's like, man, <laughs> my you know, i mean like funniest call i ever had was a guy called us for chest pain we all show up you know the whole the whole crew we get to this guy's trailer and knock on his door and he, or as we're walking up he can hear us going up the stairs and he's like hey listen like out his window bro out his window he's like hey listen uh, don't worry about coming in. I just needed you to get me a water out of that refrigerator. This guy had a, this guy had a refrigerator in his yard, and he just wanted us to give him one from his from, and so he didn't have to come outside. So oh. uh, <laughs> I, was, I, was, I couldn't believe that happened. My God, I would have so many scratches <laughs> down my face. Just oh my God, it was unbelievable, man. But uh, no, I had a I had a shift where. Uh, uh, and I'll remember the shift for the rest of my life, man. It started off with uh, a guy, or it was a 32 year old woman, cardiac arrest, overdose. She died. Then, like two hours later, uh, two hours later, we got called for a DOA or a uh, you know deceased person. We get there and uh, walk in. This woman's been dead for like two days. Oof. She's got. She, and that didn't bother me, man. I've seen a lot of dead people. What bothered me was she had cancer tumors. She had tumors all throughout her body coming out her breast she was butt naked she had them coming out her breast she had them come out everywhere and what really bothered me was i'm looking at her and i felt so bad for her yeah she was in her 50s and i was like you have suffered for years for years at, at, at least a year you've been suffering through pain and you just died like that's what really bothered me about and, that lady Not, yeah but, and 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 has i mean literally probably died alone Yes. And had been sitting in this house for two days, like probably yeah. like that's like the the sound that I make, like the oof, like I just yeah. like I I I I imagine myself walking into a situation like they they've been dead for two days, and I just go, this person was probably alone the whole time. Yeah, and that's then that's what bothered me about her. I was like, man, that's just so bad. I felt so bad for her. And then, um, <clears throat> like six hours later. I got called for a lady hit by a car. I show up and it's this woman who was just waiting across the street and this kid stole a car and hit her oh. and hit her, hit her against a pole and she was cut in half. Oh, and man. it was like, and at this, at this point I'm staring at this lady. I'm staring at like what is supposed to be a body. And I, my brain, you know, you're like, you know, like you feel your brain just go like, ah, <laughs> like, and that's yeah, there's, was. there's like, no, yeah, there's there's no logical <laughs> like, sense you can make of a situation like that. A hundred percent, bro. And my brain was like, you know what, Jason? I think we're gonna go ahead and shut down for the day. <laughs> was, but this is wait a minute. This is all the same shift. This is the same shift. This oh my god. Shift. Yeah, within twelve hours, man. Within Holy 12 hours, crap. Yeah, I had I had those three people, and like three emotional. Holy crap! What is going on? 
like calls. And um, again, dude, listen, I've seen tons of dead people. 99% of the time, it is an old person or someone who's just like, you know, I'm sorry that you are dead, but you do not care anymore. You are now in a better place. And, you know, you lived a good life. But it's human suffering is what, yes. what I, I've said this a million times. I'll see a dead person all day long. But a person with a broken femur, uh, you know, screaming, writhing in pain. And, and you just – you're just trying to get them a painkiller as fast as you possibly can just to yeah. make them feel better yeah. because you don't – pay you know, it, it is a physiological like yearning to stop the suffering of another yep. person, yep. you know? Any way you can sometimes. Exactly. So, um, oh. yeah, but – yeah, man. Uh, but that one, was one – That's one on. shift. <laughs> that was a bad yeah I, was, I got we we still had uh we still had to put our paper reports into the computers at that point in time in my career and i was sitting down and i must have had that thousand yard stare like you're talking about just staring at the computer and my cats at the time walked up to me and uh he's a caring man but never like i never saw empathy like this or sympathy like this and he walked up and he put his hand on my shoulder and he's like bro are you okay man like like if you want to go home, man, I, like I, I got you. Like we'll take care of it. And I was like, no, nah, I'm good, dude. Like I was able to process it, but I was like, Jesus Christ, man, that's. Oof. And people see that people have called people have shifts like that all the time, man. Yeah. You know. Yeah, so. and it's in the heavily urban areas, and and oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's yeah. It, I was a I was a small town hospital EMT, uh, and then uh, and then I went to a large urban area level one and the volume like just the volume just the stuff that you see in volume and thank god we have an advanced triage system because it would just we'd be completely overwhelmed overwhelmed otherwise and it's just but like the stuff are like like i think the real champions in our in our department is the triage is our triage people oh yeah like woof so yeah what what's what's uh, what's uh orientation like for you guys so so talk to me a little bit about your your first year as a medic so for me when i got hired as a firefighter uh firefighter medic is what we get hired down here Um, but i actually at the time my department didn't have an orientation i i got hired then i got a letter that said show up with enough stuff for 24 hours um and you're your clothes that you've been issued. So, <laughs> um, for me, it wasn't, you know, oh. show up. And that was it, man. Yeah. It was, it was insanity, dude. It was, you know, but, um, for the new guys now we have, a uh, depending on what department you're at, but for us, it's a four to eight week, uh, training, depending on the size of the class, they go through everything. Um, you know, they're, uh, you know, we go through all the firefighting tactics, all the stuff, because I don't know about hospitals, but, um, I know it changes from hospital to hospital depending on your medical director, but for us, you know, uh, tactics will change depending on where you're at, and then uh, then your medical stuff depending on your medical director. But um, they go through a one month thing where they learn all of our tactics, and then uh, they go through a one week class of medical protocols just to kind of get them up to date of what we do. Then they're on the trucks for about uh, two to three months. And uh, depending on the demand, and then they will go into a uh, four to six month preceptor program where we where we watch them run calls and, mm-hmm. and run them through phases and stuff like that. So it sure. uh, wasn't like that for me. It was kind of just like, hey, go. It was even <laughs> worse for the guys. The guys before me, it was even worse for them. So ready, go. Yeah. So it, much, it yeah. was a. I mean, you went through a real trial by fire then. <laughs> you know, it, it like it, for us. Yeah, it, it was definitely a little more wild, wild west. But the guys prior to me were even worse. Yeah, the guys like I want to say that were hired fifteen to seventeen years ago in our area. Um, these guys were just lined up, man. They were like, "Hey, you like you showed up." On, depending on even today, depending with firefighting uh, operations, mm-hmm. you go to the you go to a one area, man, and they're literally you show up first day, and they're like, "Hey, here's the deal. You see this thing right here." This is, this is pump panel, okay? You pull this right here. It's called tank the pump. And then uh, pull this handle right here, and you'll send us water. That That's first day. They're in control of the most important part of firefighting. Uh, you know, it's like things are the wild, wild west in places. Um, but for us, yeah, they, they, you sh- they show up, man, and we try to train them the best that you can. But, you know, as a nurse, like, y- y- you get a certain amount of training, and then eventually – 
time to go to the wolves, man. Yep. And they, you, you, that's the only way you're going to learn. Yeah, Obviously, that's what like, for sure. Too. Like that's yeah. The, I had I w- I had uh, three preceptors. One was just you know just the the first few days, just you know, orient yeah. orient uh, orient yourself to the to the. Uh, to the layout of the building essentially right mm-hmm. um yeah. and then and then i had one preceptor who was uh i think it was his goal to overwhelm people like yeah and and i said something like that to one of the other nurses who i absolutely love and and i i and i love working with them they're like well yeah you should be you should be overwhelmed in your orientation because you have a very short amount of time in order to learn an incredible, you know, a lifetime's worth of experiences so you can yeah. go out and operate in the real world more or less independently. But, oh, yeah, that, that the trial by fire, it can be really, I mean, it can be really, really tough. It, it is hard, but it is necessary because that's where you find out really fast. And, again, like, you know, for, for a lot of people, for late Hopefully, you know, anyone who listens to this that's not in the medical field, no one just gets dropped into the middle and like, hey, you got 10 patients you're allowed to kill. And then after that, we got to talk, you know, like there, there's always somebody <laughs> making sure like you're not doing anything bad. Like, um, but you have to you have to struggle. That is the only way. That's why, you know, again, you I can teach you everything that you want and you are useless until you understand how to apply it. Right. So the, you know, the trial by fire is definitely 100% um, necessary uh, as long as it's a controlled fire kind of thing. <laughs> so the main theme of the show, um, and we talked about this a little bit, is like there's more to school than just learning content. And, and we kind of yeah. covered that a little bit. But, you know, meaning factors outside of school, in my estimation, are often the cause of strife inside school. So is there is there any advice that you can offer people who are you know, might be struggling outside of school or, or maybe even they're, they're, they're struggling with details outside of their life today while they're in the job that, that, that might help them kind of get, get themselves back on track. I mean, I, I think humor is a yeah. huge factor of that, but, but what, what other kinds of things might you suggest? I mean, yeah, obviously laugh, try to find <clears throat> I appreciate people that define their life uh, by multiple factors. You are yep. not just a nurse. Yep. You know, you are not just a firefighter. You are a human. You know, you are, uh, you know, you were a college baseball star and now you're a nurse. And, you know, find things outside of your, of what you do for a living uh, and you will find healthy balance very quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, that that's <clears throat> not to mention the fact that, you know, when you finish being a nurse or a firefighter, an EMT or a police officer, when you retire, if your entire identity has been only centralized in what you do for a living, man, you are going to find a very big gap in your life very fast. It's going to be very depressing. So, um, yeah, just just try to find, uh, you know, exercise. Obviously, everybody says that, you know, try to do something, even if it's walking outside right now, you're quarantined in your house, like open up your window and stick your face out in the sun for 15 minutes. Go or, you your, know, like yeah, go in your back. <laughs> if you have one yeah you go in your backyard you know sit lay out on your driveway vitamin d is a really good thing because you know i didn't know this but they shouldn't even call vitamin d a vitamin because it's not a vet it's not necessarily a vitamin it's a it's a chemical um and it, it's responsible for some like ridiculous amount of neurotransmitting or uh, uh different transactions in your body like it was like a thousand or something like mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. um I, I learned that the other day uh but uh or like five years ago but um <clears throat> so get outside like do something find healthy balance um you know don't bring try not to bring your stuff your personal stuff to work which is always impossible um but you know just just find a balance man don't define your life by your employment so where where can where can i send my uh my listeners to where are you from again so uh i'm from the uh south florida area that's as much you're gonna get out <laughs> but, no, no uh, i mean i mean like uh oh what, what's what's the channel <laughs> okay. come on i'm trying to help you out here dude yeah <laughs> Uh, so help fire me department help chronicles. you <laughs> so fire department chronicles on uh facebook instagram youtube tiktok and then uh the coffee company is fire department coffee that's uh fire department coffee dot, or fire d-e-p-t coffee.com you can just google us and you'll find us all right i'll put a i'll put a link in the description for fire department coffee and uh put a link to the youtube channel is is awesome. that is that is that where you want me to send people to, to the youtube channel 
Or does it matter? Uh, or, or Facebook, whatever. Okay. Yeah, YouTube, Facebook, so whatever. I'll, yeah. I'll do any anything I can find. I'm kind of terrible at uh, social media in general, so uh, hopefully I can find somebody to, to help me out with that. But yeah, I'll put I'll put links links in the description, and uh, we'll send some people to uh, God. What's it called again? I forget. Fire Department Chronicles and Fire Department Coffee. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Jason. I appreciate you coming on. Thanks for your time. I appreciate it, brother. Thank you so much, man. All right. Sponsoring this segment of the Real Talk School of Nursing podcast is Mike and Bonnie's Snow Shovel and Driveway Salt Emporium. You know, when the temperature drops fast and rain turns to ice in your driveway, which is then covered by six inches of snow, you need two things. Snow shovels and driveway salt. Luckily, there's one place you can get both of those things. They have everything. They have all of your favorite trenchers, cleanouts, border spades, cap rocks, post hole diggers, grain scoops, and hand trowels. That's right. Everyone from the toddler in a sandbox to the fashionable urbanite and the sudden hardened farmer. Mike and Bonnie's Snow Shovel and Driveway Salt Emporium can cover all of your scooping, transferring, farming, digging, and shoveling needs. So, stop by Mike and Bonnie's Snow Shovel and Driveway Salt Emporium off Route 44, where the only thing that's deeper than the holes you can dig with their great shovels is their discounts. Bring your receipt from Nick's Horseless Diner and get an extra 5% off of your purchase. Oh, wait, this just in from Stuffy's, where all the food is served by waiters and waitresses on horseback, that if you bring your hoof print marked placemats, you can get an extra 10% off of your purchase. I asked if this was in addition to the 10% you get off for being a Real Talk School of Nursing podcast listener, and all I got in response was... <laughs> I'm not entirely sure what that means, so let's get back to the show. This Real Talk School of Nursing podcast is a Real Talk production. This podcast is dedicated in loving memory of my brother, First Lieutenant Justin Smith, Blood and Steel. Six Semper Tyrannis, Facta Non Verba. Good night, Steve Cannon. Wherever you are. are. On young, Casayo. Now you go home. Thanks for listening and subscribing. You can support the show directly on our Patreon account at www.patreon.com slash realtalknursing. And for less than that cup of coffee you'll never have time to drink at work, you can gain patron benefits such as early content, shoutouts, and special swag. When you support our show, you're also supporting our friends, affiliates, and sponsors. Contact us through email at realtalknursing at gmail.com or through Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter if you have a topic or story you'd like us to discuss on the show. Huge thanks to all our new followers on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. More listeners means more and better shows. Make sure to share the podcast with classmates, underclassmen, and colleagues, and let's welcome them to our community of fun, engaged, and supportive nursing students and nurses. And let us know if you have a classmate or coworker that could use some recognition or words of encouragement, and we'll give them a special shout out on the show. If you like the show, the Real Talk School of Nursing podcast is available on iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Libsyn web player, Stitcher, YouTube, Spotify, and SoundCloud. So go to wherever you download your podcast, subscribe, rate us, review us, write into the show, and hit that subscribe button. Remember to leave only five-star reviews because that's the only ratings that count to get us noticed by more nursing students. I want you to be a part of this crazy nursing school journey. Real Talk School of Nursing podcast is a holy moly, I can't believe you're still listening to this podcast, podcast. Podcast.